Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Campus Party at Galileo Stage. Now, I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker from the European Space Age to graphene startups. I'd like to introduce to you Tim Harper on tomorrow's technology. Tim Harper, everybody. Uh, thanks, everybody. I uh, hope you can hear me amongst uh, all the noise here. Um, it's a bit of a Tower of Babel. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about something that uh, appears to have very little to do with a lot of the other things that are going on here. But uh, hopefully, uh, in about 20 minutes or half an hour's time, you'll, you'll start to realize the connection. So what I do is I used to work for the European Space Agency trying to break things for the simple reason that if we've got something halfway to Jupiter or Mars and something breaks then it's lost forever along with about 20 million uh, pounds worth of investment in it. So we used to spend a lot of time trying to understand the properties of materials and how these things worked, how we could make things more reliable and how we could get things to work in a space environment and keep them working. In doing that, what I wanted to do was, if something did fail, take it apart pretty much atom by atom so that I would understand how it worked and what the failure mechanism was. And of course, that led me into working in areas like nanotechnology. Um, and I think most of the innovations I've been involved in, and I've been involved in a lot from uh, materials companies to scientific instrument startups through to uh, graphene and life sciences, but it's, it's all about materials. And if you just look at the history of humanity, it's all about taking some kind of material and getting it to do something that's useful for us. And it doesn't really matter what that is, but it's all about understanding the properties of materials even in the life sciences, and you'll, we'll come back to that later, and all the way through to, uh, to, the, uh, to the early stages of computing. And I think what we're finding is that materials have really shaped our culture and economy for the whole of human history. So to start off with, 20, 25,000 years ago, we were effectively wandering around picking up materials we found in the environment, whether that's a piece of wood or a piece of stone. And then we gradually found that some bits of stone you could sharpen into a flint. You found, we found that other bits contained metal ores, and we started moving into things like bronze and iron ages. And we gradually got more and more sophisticated through steel. And probably the big bang in materials was about 120, 130 years ago in Germany and Switzerland, where we came up with the idea of synthetic chemistry, which led to things like polymers and nylons. Uh, that's progressed quite well. And now, uh, by, uh, by 15 years ago, we were getting quite comfortable with things like nanomaterials, nanotechnology. And now we're moving, pushing that even for further forward into areas like synthetic biology. But I think one of the things that has really changed over the last 50 years is that science is becoming a startup. And, uh, and it's something that is appropriate in an entrepreneurial startup culture. 50, 60 years ago, end of the Second World War, science was done in large institutions, required lots of people, lots of resources to be able to do anything. And unfortunately, once you have a lot of people involved in something, there's a lot of excuses for people to say, no, I don't like that, it'll never work, and, and shoot things down. Um, now we've effectively automated a lot of that, but if you've ever tried to get a, a business funded with a bank, you'll find that the computers still say no. But the fundamentals of everything that we're doing, things like you know, transistors, basic electronics, grew out of huge organizations like Bell Labs, and they were the only people who could chuck enough resources at science to keep it going. Well, that's all changed now. You can do it in a dorm room, you can do a bit, a bit of software, you can do it in a garage, if you want. And, and the, the entrepreneurial spirit of the IT industry, where you say you can start small and then build it, is actually filtering through to a lot of other areas of science. So it doesn't require resources of a huge company to do things now, because information is available. You can communicate with people pretty much in real time. And you don't need 20,000 people working for IBM to start coming up with future devices uh, like this, 
or even failed future devices like our atomic-powered flying cars. So what does the future look like uh, in terms of materials? Well, one of the jobs I do with the World Economic Forum is every year we try to come up with uh, top 10 emerging technologies, the technologies that we think are going to be very significant. And we're talking about technologies here in terms of things that are new knowledge, but uh, and we have various criteria, but really what I'm interested in as an entrepreneur is any technologies that really have the potential to disrupt or create entire new industries. And that's, uh, that's probably the most important thing, although social political impacts uh, are also very important. So I'll just fairly quickly go through the, uh, the top 10 from this year, so just so you can get an idea of where we are. So. Online electric vehicles, um, the problem we're really trying to solve there is to get away from having to carry around bulky batteries. And the way these things work is you have, uh, you, you have the, the current carried by an electrical conductor in the road and a pickup coil under the vehicle which re receives the, uh, the power remotely. And uh, that's beginning to be trialed in, uh, in places like South Korea. 3D printing, uh, this is always, I think, probably should be the most significant one at the moment, certainly in terms of public perception. Uh, all we're doing there is instead of printing a two-dimensional uh, thing, we're just moving printing it into the z-axis. So where we are at the moment is we can do some very interesting things with, uh, with polymers, with additive manufacturing, and as we start bringing in more and more technologies such as conductive polymers, such as graphene, then we start coming up with the possibility to make more active devices rather than just a, a simple model of something. This is uh, a very key one, I always think, self-healing materials. This is something that we're learning from nature. Um, things in nature, if they're damaged, they don't just stay damaged. Whereas, as I found when, we, when I was at the Space Agency, if something was halfway to, uh, to Mars and a transistor and a communication circuit blew, then that would definitely stay damaged and it would probably still be going around Mars, but not telling us that it was doing. Uh, a lot of work going on on things like self-healing concrete, self-healing materials, and there's various ways you can do that. You can have bacterial spores in there that bind and form a, a kind of a polymer when, uh, when mixed with water. When the, when, the, uh, when the shell of these things is broken, you can have little sacks of polymer gel. Or you can do what Caltech are doing with electronic circuits and actually design them in a way that they, they can take a lot of punishment and you can blast them with a laser and the circuit will reconfigure itself because it's sensed that it's been damaged. Now, if you think about it, that's getting a lot closer to the way that nature works, to the way the human brain works, rather than what we do in microelectronics with a standard von Neumann architecture where we have one block producer signal goes in, there's an output, goes into the next one, goes into the next one, and if one link in that chain fails, the entire circuit fails. So self-healing circuits, I think, have a lot of potential. We've got a lot of work going on energy efficient water purification. At the moment, what we effectively do is either boil water to remove impurities, you know, evaporate it, or we force it the wrong way through a membrane reverse osmosis, which requires a lot of high pressure. So there's a lot of interesting work going on in areas such as uh, forward osmosis now, where we actually use a, uh, a salt solution, a carrier solution that we know we can easily recover the water from. And that, uh, that requires a lot less energy. Another one I think is beginning, a little bit counterintuitive for a lot of people, but it's beginning to gain a lot of credence, is the idea of carbon dioxide as a resource. Um, we, we keep hearing uh, a lot about what a menace carbon dioxide is, how we have to cut down emissions. But another way of thinking about it is, well, if we've got this stuff, 
we've got to find a use for it. Now, um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has a half-life of, I think it's about 100,000 uh, years. So if we, cut, if we cut carbon dioxide emissions down to zero tomorrow, it wouldn't make a lot of difference to the planet for, uh, for a very long time. So we've got to start thinking a little bit differently about carbon dioxide. One of the things you can do that is to create carbon dioxide to organic molecules via things like uh, algae and various other kind of bugs. And, and this is a big project in Israel for the production of uh, ethanol, uh, basically using carbon dioxide and sunlight. We have other projects underway looking at things like building materials made in exactly the same way. There's, Enhanced nutrition at the molecular level. I think this is another thing that we're finding as we understand the properties of material as life sciences and material science gradually collide. Uh, and probably one of the most important uh, results of this are, are foods such as golden rice, where we're, we're engineering rice to contain vitamin A that can then combat a whole range of, uh, of uh, malnutrition-related diseases, including blindness. And, and, and frankly, these things should be preventable through technology. Remote sensing is something that everybody's very excited about. And uh, the World Economic Forum does a lot of work with the automotive industry, which is why we have that particular graphic there. Uh, the automotive industry is very interested in things like vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle sensing for real-time congestion um, information. Uh, that's probably a little bit, little bit boring. Where I think we're, we're going with all this sensing is moving towards the Internet of Things, and this thermostat is just one of the things, and I'll talk about a few of the others in a minute. We've also got things like precise drug delivery through nanoscale engineering. Now, the, 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 the thing I particularly like about that is if we're trying to treat a disease at the moment, what we tend to do is flood the body with, with the drug. And it doesn't really matter whether that's, um, whether that's a, uh, a chemotherapy agent or, or whether it's just an anti-inflammatory for, for a headache. And more precise targeting really involves two things. One is understanding how we can deliver something to the site of inflammation, to the site of the damaged cells, the diseased cells. And the other part of it is actually hiding that drug from the immune system so that you can get it all the way to the site of interest. And people are doing a lot of work with things like uh, gold nanoparticles, attaching that to, uh, to DNA to actually get that into, uh, into where it's supposed to be. Organic electronics and photovoltaics. Um, we've been using silicon for a long time. Conducting polymers have been around for about 15 years. And they're at the stage now where I think they're just about to start becoming mainstream. The biggest application of these has been in solar voltaics, solar photovoltaics, effectively plastic flexible solar cells. And the big advantage of organic electronics is you're printing these things on a roll-to-roll -roll process rather than making them in a batch process. So if you look at the costs of setting up a uh, 300 millimeter silicon wafer fab at the moment, it's, uh, it's well over a billion dollars, whereas you could produce a similar output on, uh, from organic or plastic electronics for about a tenth of that cost. Um, the downside is that there are some fundamental limits in organic electronics, so you're never going to get, get up to the speeds you can get in, in silicon, gallium arsenide, and other materials. But for a lot of the sensors and, and uh, uh, basic electronics we're going to be using in the Internet of Things, it's probably quite, quite sufficient in terms of performance. Um, in terms of the photovoltaics, the... Efficiency has got up to about 22% at the moment, which is quite good. The trick, though, really is to combine the efficiency, the cost, and the lifetime. And that's, uh, that's why these things aren't quite on the market now. And then the one that always surprises people is fourth-generation nuclear. And uh, when we think about nuclear energy, when we think about disasters like uh, Fukushima, 
what we, uh, what we don't realize, or a lot of people don't realize, is that we're talking about technology that is 50 or 60 years old. And people have taken a lot of new approaches to nuclear energy over the last decade, whether that's the, you know, effectively the pocket nukes, the sort of the back garden nuclear power stations, or whether it's just the, the kind of pebble bed um, reactors that will just shut themselves down if there's a problem and, and, uh, and not cause any problems. So that's one area where I think we're quite overdue a, a rethink. But what that leads us to is really, I think we've got three converging opportunities um, uh, 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 for, for the world at the moment, and probably one big challenge that I think we can use that to address. So the big, the first, first opportunity I think is uh, it's pretty much what everybody's dealing with here: data, information. Um, we're generating so much data. The problem is actually getting the information out of the data. Now, when I first started out in science, we used to have uh, various instruments. We'd hook them up to a chart recorder, and acquiring the data was the part that could, would take the time. And we'd get this uh, chart, we'd uh, pore over it and measure peaks and things and try to figure out what the material was. Now we can just automate all of that, and data isn't a problem. We can have a room full of gene sequences working 24-7, 365 days uh, a, a year w without any problem. So the the big issue really is extracting the valuable information from the data. And as we start moving more and more towards this Internet of Things idea, there's more sort of big data plays coming out. Now, I go to a lot of these conferences and people have come up with a, a lot of big data plays. And um, I'd say a lot of them tend to be a little bit on the, on the boring side, things like tracking brand awareness through Twitter feeds, things like that, stuff we've been able to do other means. Um, one of the big opportunities uh, we always feel is in healthcare. So, for example, if I go to the, uh, to the doctors tomorrow, he doesn't have access to all the information that I've been spreading around the web, whether that's through Twitter, uh, Facebook, Foursquare. Um, and uh, if there's a way to actually start crunching that uh, that data, make it available to physicians, then they're in a position to make far better diagnosis. Uh, the problem is we don't really collect all of that data. It's, uh, it's a bit of a random process. Or I'd say it, it was, and there's, uh, there's a lot of talk these days about the quantified self, about being able to track a whole range of biomarkers, not just including the number of steps you take, but, uh, but things like hemoglobin levels, uh, cholesterol levels, things like that, and make the appropriate uh, adjustments to your, uh, to your lifestyle. So that's, that's one opportunity. I think the second one I want to mention is graphene. There's, uh, it seems like every time I pick up a newspaper at the moment, including the financial, financial press, there's something about graphene. So what do we mean by graphene? Well, it's our old friend carbon, which is one of the basic building blocks of life and one of the most abundant elements in the universe. Usually we encounter it in the form of something like uh, like coal or oil, for example. And if we look at the structure of most carbon compounds, you can see you get this nice regular hexagonal lattices and you get some you know, various other molecules, atoms hanging off that. Uh, another form that we know is diamond, of course, we're all familiar with that. And that's a very strong form of carbon, a tetrahedral lattice, so it all locks, all the atoms lock together, so it can't be compressed or pulled apart. Very, very strong. And the other form of carbon that, that we really know about is, is graphite, which we're all familiar with, with uh, if you've ever used a pencil. And what happens in graphite is, once again, you have these nice hexagonal rings of carbon, very tightly bound together, but they're in layers, and, uh, and those layers are quite weakly held together. So that was what we thought about carbon until about 1985, when Harry Croto, Richard Smalley, and, uh, and Bob Curl realized that there was another form of carbon called uh, C60s, named after, or named buckyballs after uh, Buckminster Fuller, Fuller and his uh, geodesic domes. That was soon followed by uh, a Japanese researcher in 89, Sumio Ijima, who discovered yet another form, which was uh, the carbon nanotube, which, uh, which is rolled up sheets of carbon. 
And uh, a lot of work went into both of those without too much commercial success until uh, Andrei Game and uh, Christoph uh, Novoselov up at the uh, University of Manchester in 2004 were just messing about on a Friday afternoon with a bit of graphite trying to make thinner and thinner layers and the way they did that was to get a piece of, uh, of scotch tape and peel off a bit of the graphite and then take another bit of scotch tape and peel another layer off that until eventually they got down to a very very thin layer of carbon called graphene which turned out to have some quite remarkable properties. Uh, so graphene is effectively, in its purest form, is just a single layer of, of carbon atoms. So it's effectively a two-dimensional material. The way you do it is you start off with graphite and you split it into thinner and thinner layers. Now you don't need to use uh, scotch tape anymore because it's not a very practical method of doing it. But what you can do is you can use various other things like acids, uh, ultrasound, plasma, to split up that, those, uh, those graphene, graphite planes. Split into smaller and smaller layers until what you end up with is graphene. And that's pretty much what graphite looks like. You can see those layers in there. And the trick is to split those apart until you end up with something like that. And that's, uh, that's graphene made by uh, one of the companies we deal with. It's Quite a brilliant material, actually, and uh, unlike a lot of the other carbons, because it's a, a two-dimensional material, it kind of lends itself to processing in, uh, in, in various industries, whether that's the semiconductor industry or the, or the polymer industry. So it's a better electronic conductor than copper. It'll conduct electrons at about 10% uh, of the speed of light. Um, it's got fantastic thermal conductivity, so people are already looking at it for heat dissipation in electronic circuits. Uh, harder than diamond and 300 times stronger than steel, I should say, but that's only if you have a single sheet of graphene and find some way to support it. And usually when you put that into some other material, you're compromising it. But the theory is that you should be able to support uh, the weight of an elephant on the tip of a pencil uh, on, a, uh, on a sheet of graphene if you could find a way of, uh, of holding the graphene and the elephant. Uh, because of that, it's already finding uses in things like tennis rackets. Head have announced this graphene tennis racket that, uh, that you can pay a premium for. I think uh, as far as we can tell, there's only a very, very small amount of graphene in there and uh, uh, it probably doesn't affect the properties of the, the racket very much, but from a marketing perspective, it's, uh, it's a great trick and it seems to, be, seems to be working for head. But I think where we're really going with this is things like uh, thin, flexible displays. So companies like Samsung are already all over this and the idea is that you can come up with uh, polymer-based electronics, stretchable electronics, things that are transparent, flexible, reconfigurable, and, uh, and I think graphene is going to be a, a key part of, of, of that. Um, Samsung, uh, amongst others, are all over this, and you can see that from the, uh, from the patents they're filing. Another nice thing about graphene is you can turn it into forms that are useful uh, for other things. So. Uh, uh, one of the big efforts at the moment is developing graphene-based inks, so electronic inks, where you have this wonderfully conductive material, and then you can start printing circuit interconnects out of that. Uh, so it's not just the standard printing. And I think, as I mentioned, once you start getting into serious 3D printing, then we're going to need to have the electrical functionality uh, that you can print through both graphene and, uh, and the organic electronics. Another great thing about graphene is it's, um, it's biocompatible. I spent uh, a couple of days with some toxicologists about a month ago uh, discussing the toxicology of graphene and they really couldn't think of any major problems with it. So it's kind of nice that you have some material that is biocompatible, which means that then you can use that in, uh, in, in healthcare devices and, and sensors and, and a lot of people are already beginning to start you know, growing neurons on graphene substrates, thinking of using graphene materials as, substra as scaffolds for stem cell growth, for bone growth, etc. Um, one of the 
big markets, and I think the, the, the big challenges that we have everywhere at the moment is, uh, is just things like lithium-ion batteries and, and lifetimes. One of the things that graphene can do, and this is effectively because it has a very, very high surface area, so if I had uh, a gram of graphene here, uh, I could, it would probably have the same surface area as this whole arena and more. So uh, because you have a very high surface area, there's lots of places you can stick an electron. So that means it can hold a lot of charge. And when we're talking about battery replacement, I think one of the, the best candidates isn't really building a better lithium-ion battery. It's using things like supercapacitors that will allow you to uh, rapidly charge and discharge uh, them whilst having the same kind of uh, charge capacity as, uh, as, as, a, as a standard battery. Uh, oddly enough, uh, some people over at the University of Berkeley have found that you can actually produce these uh, supercapacitors just by printing graphene onto, uh, onto a CD and using a CD burner to, uh, to actually uh, create these materials. So, as I mentioned, what I like about graphene is it's a lot easier to work with and process than a lot of the other nanomaterials. And the idea there is that we should be able to get rid of a lot of the uh, a lot of the the problems associated with charging and keeping devices charged um, just as an aside if you intercalate graphene let's say if you mix graphene with about four or five percent silicon and use it in the anno anode of a lithium-ion battery instead of uh, instead of carbon um, the initial results are showing that you increase the capacity of that battery by a factor of four or five times. But for most hybrid electric vehicle manufacturers, if you just increase the range by a factor of two or three, then that makes it a viable technology rather than uh, you know, the fairly short ranges we have at the moment. Now, one of the interesting things about graphene that people have been playing with, is they found that it actually sounds great. Uh, I used to spend a lot of time in acoustics, and, and in acoustics what you really want to have is what we call the ideal speaker, which uh, shouldn't have any mass, it should be very thick, sorry, very thin, and it should be very stiff, and of course most materials just aren't like that. Turns out graphene is, and uh, a variety of researchers have been working on graphene for um, for acoustic properties, they've, they've started playing around making earphones and the initial results are that it does actually sound uh, uh, as good as it should do. And one of the things that's kind of unexpected uh, for a lot of people when we talk about graphene, though not too un unexpected if you think about its structure, is the applications in areas such as water purification. And um, we're not just talking about water purification here, we're talking about anything where you want to select, water, let water pass and reject other materials. So, you know, we could be talking about desalination of water. On the other hand, we could be talking about artificial kidneys uh, and other sort of and, and membranes for separations of, of chemicals. So the, the trick there is just to be able to control the pore size in these materials so that in this case, you can see the, uh, the, the stuff at the bottom, the water can pass through and the things that are a little bit bigger than that tend to be... Uh, tend to bounce off it. Um, where I think the, the holy grail of graphene is going to be is in things like ultra-fast electronics and people at MIT have already been producing transistors that are clocking at about 450 gigahertz, that's gigahertz not megahertz, uh, and uh, it's early days yet, and I think we're, we're probably going to be able to get up to the, uh, the terahertz level. But on the other hand, that's going to probably take about another sort of best part of 10 years before we actually, actually get there. Because for most intents and purposes, silicon's quite good, and there's quite a bit of the roadmap left though, where, where we've got room for improvement. So, which brings me on to the third opportunity that we're finding through materials, and especially nanomaterials, and that's in making use of what we understand from nature. I, I touched upon that briefly earlier, and uh, here's an old friend of mine. It's uh, something called the spotted asparagus beetle, and it's, um, it's, uh, it's a pest. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really serious pest in some places. And the thing I like about pests is um, they usually, usually means they're very good at doing something. 
But in terms of looking at this with, a, with the eyes of a materials nanoscientist, you think, well, well, this is a fantastic thing because this thing has color, but the color comes from structure, comes from optical, optical reflections rather than, uh, rather than from pigments or dye. Um, it has stiffness, it's breathable, it's waterproof, and it's very hard for us to replicate any kind of materials like that. So if you think about uh, Gore-Tex, would maybe give you the, uh, the, the waterproof and breathable. Where do you get the rigidity from? And, it, and, and we get all this all in one material, called, a protein called chitin. So um, nature can, can tell us a lot about how we should go about designing materials and why this is important is because nature designs these things from the bottom up, whereas we, didn't, we tend to design things from the top down. So, you know, we take some oil, we crack it into various fragments, we, uh, we, uh, we, we turn that into polymers, we give those polymers different properties, we combine them in a different way, and, and we chuck it, we use a lot of energy and we chuck a lot of stuff away whilst we're doing that, whereas in nature it all tends to come from the, uh, from the bottom up. So, another good example of that is, um, is just any kind of software that we use. Now, a copy of Microsoft Office I've got uh, on this laptop, the last time I looked, it took up uh, about one, one and a quarter gigabytes of, of disk space. Now, what, what does that software do? Well, it, uh, you know, it allows us to give presentations, it allows us to write documents and format them, um, but is it anywhere near as useful as something like the, uh, the human genome, which contains all the instructions to make all of us, uh, provides all our genetic history, it's, uh, it's uh, self-replicating, uh, self self-healing, incredibly persistent. We can go back a couple of billion years using the information in the genome, whereas, um, whereas uh, you know, we can still read DNA, but I can't read a floppy disk I might have burned uh, 10 years ago. So this is a wonderful data storage medium. Any, anybody, any idea how many gigabytes, terabytes or whatever, you know, it would take if we, uh, if we encoded the human genome in binary? Seven hundred and seventy megabytes for all of that. So um, that's a wonderful example of how nature is fantastically efficient at doing things in its analog kind of way, whereas with our you know our digital genius of, uh, of of smartphones and laptops and everything else, we're still quite crude in in comparison. So here's another. Uh, interesting paper that was published a couple of years ago, someone calculated the entire computing power of the world. So that was a couple of years ago, so it's a little bit of an underestimate now, but that included all of the supercomputers, smartphones, laptops, tablets, and, uh, and everything else. And the result was that the amount of information that it could, uh, or the amount of in instructions that could be processed were pretty much the equivalent of one human brain. So all of the computing equipment on the planet was the equivalent of one human brain. So that's another illustration of how far we've got to go before we can start uh, 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 competing with some of the things that nature has, uh, has, uh, has already given us. So what that means is when we start thinking about building things, uh, more and more people now are starting to thinking about building things from the bottom up. And whereas we've been trying to force materials to do something that we wanted them to do, so getting silicon to uh, process information, sure we can do it, but the reason we have to do it in binary is because we don't have enough control over the processes, or we didn't at the early days, to be able to distinguish between various states. So it's easier to just have on and off, and we say on is this range of voltages and off is a lower range of voltages, and, and that made it a little easier to, to deal with. Nature, I think, you know, we, uh, as life sciences, information technology and materials, nanotechnology are, are converging, what we're finding is we're understanding more and more about how cells work, how biology works, and that allows us to start thinking about when we design a material, instead of 
forcing it to do something it doesn't want to do, we can start thinking about, how, well, how would nature do it? So we want to store information or we want to process information. Um, we want to, we want you know, properties X, Y, Z, whether that's electrical or, or optical. Can we build a material or a system from the bottom up that will get us that rather than trying to force something to do it against its will? So if we start combining you know, materials and nanotechnology, life sciences, and information technology, well, where does it get us? Well, quite a long way, it turns out. Now, you're all familiar with, with Moore's Law, so I won't bore you with, uh, with that. But where it gets quite interesting, if you start looking at the, uh, at the speed or the cost of, of gene sequencing, you can see that it follows this logarithmic uh, straight line almost, pretty much like Moore's Law. And um, what we're finding is that there is a Moore's Law for life sciences as well as for, uh, for electronics. And that's finding a lot more application now in projects like the Materials Genome Institute in the US, where the idea is, well, can we start learning these tricks from nature when we're trying to design new materials? Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's early days, we're, we're getting there. We're probably, from a scientific perspective, I'd say we're so close to materials by design, we can almost taste it. We're not quite there, but we probably will be in the next decade or so. So, where does that where does that really take us with all of this? Um, 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 what's the opportunity? Well, as an entrepreneur, you know, you tend to write a lot of business plans and they all have somewhere some curve that's rising up and you can show that something's growing, so therefore that's you know, demand or profits or whatever, so therefore it's got to be a good business. If we look at that uh, as we do when I'm working with the, uh, the World Economic Forum on, on more of a macro scale, we can see that there's you know, quite a number of, uh, of problems in the world. So we have you know, population, we have resources, general lack of resources that comes up every now and again, and that doesn't really matter whether it's energy or, uh, or rare earths, things like indium for indium tin oxide for, uh, for, for touchscreen devices. And as a result of the way we transport things around the world, we end up with you know, these inevitable disasters. So if we look at population, I think everybody always gets a little bit terrified by these rising population growths, but you can look at it as a, as a rising market. Now, where I think we have to get a little bit smarter is when we look at not just the population, but we also look at the rise in people's income. So, so what happens is when people get up to this level of about 10,000 uh, US dollars per capita income, um, they start wanting stuff. So they start wanting, you know, first of all, it's fridges, then mopeds, then cars, then smartphones, then computers, and then bigger houses, and, and so on. And it's this shift uh, in wealth that's really creating uh, a huge demand for, uh, for resources. And I think going back to what we've said about this top-down versus bottom-up approach, um, that gives us... Um, the market for, for what we're trying to do, what we, how we're trying to address the challenge. And, and it doesn't matter what, uh, what indicator you look at, this is, this is energy use, uh, water use, population, but you see there's, there's tremendous pressure. So um, for companies that can harness the power of materials to address these issues, there's a big and growing market, not just with governments and NGOs, but with the, uh, with the final end users. And I think what we're finding, certainly through, uh, through the work at the, uh, at the forum, is that we're quite optimistic about where technology can take us. So given the resources at our disposal, and, and we're probably living in a golden age of science, we've got more people doing more science than ever before in human history. Uh, we've got new universities popping up all over China. Everybody can talk to each other almost instantaneously. You don't have to wait for things to be published and then get a photocopy of some uh, journal article before you can start work on anything. 
Um, so the scientific resources are there. We've got the information technology resources that are driving our modeling of materials, our understanding of life sciences. So, so it's effectively a golden age of science. And I think as long as we can have this sustained and responsible technology innovation, we can support a world of six, seven, eight billion, uh, eight billion people, but also sust sustain that world uh, in, uh, in a way that allows people to have rising lifestyles and become uh, healthier and, and generally happier. So I think just to uh, just to try and keep to time and, 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 uh, and wrap up a little bit, what we're finding is that given all these, given these tools, the uh, life sciences, materials, information technology, there's no shortage of, of technologies at all. But probably what we have to do is we've got to look beyond apps. And, and the problem that we get at the moment is if you're going out trying to get a technology business funded, uh, a lot of people think that technology means information technology, and uh, especially in the venture capital world. And, and to some extent, you know, you can't blame them for doing that because you can fund a couple of guys with a laptop and end up with a, you know, with a Google and a Facebook. Whereas if you're trying to do something in life sciences, um, you've, you've got to fund a, a lab full of people. You've got to go through all the various regulatory procedures. So it's not quite as simple, although the rewards uh, can be equally big if you get it right. But I think we've really got to look beyond the apps and start thinking about the, um, the systems that, uh, that those apps are running on, whether that's the hardware or the wetware, us. Um, it doesn't really matter. We've got to do them. And I think you know, we've, we've got the tools to be able to make a, a major change in the world and a major shift in the world and it's something that we you know that, that that really isn't an option we have to we have to be able to do that if we're going to end up with our you know wonderful utopian future that uh, that i think we all want in our hearts of hearts but uh, don't know quite how to uh, how to achieve so uh, if you want any information you can get in touch with, with me using the uh, the usual kind of uh, usual kind of methods so any questions or comments? Oh, sorry, can we have a microphone down here? Sorry. You mentioned uh, that uh, in health industry right now, uh, there's a problem with uh, getting away w from immunity system while delivering some medicine or drugs to a particular mm -hmm. part of the body. Uh, but isn't it going to a bad way too that uh, we can deliver some toxic, uh, I know substance, I don't know, some, some, some kind of substance to a particular uh, part of the body if we get away th from the Im immune system? Well, delivering a toxic system to the entire body is the way that medicine works at the moment. <laughs> and, 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 and really, you know, the, the trick that we're trying to pull off, and I think we can, is to deliver that toxic substance just to those diseased cells and not, and not affect the rest of the body. And that's the whole point of targeted, very highly targeted therapies. So avoiding the immune system is one thing, but also you've got to be able to detect which those cells are the, that are diseased. And the idea is some nano injection or a small robot that would go there, or how is the idea? Well, uh, what the, what we tend to do is, is if you can understand how how cells work, how the signaling mechanism of disease cells work, then you can what we're what we're really doing with sort of the nanomedicine isn't, isn't so much robots and things like that. That's, uh, you know, we, we've got cells that, that, uh, that will do that function. But what we're trying to do is deliver things in a different form. So, for example, um, with some of the cancer therapeutics, if you make the particles smaller, they're more soluble. You know, we're 80, 80 85% water, and a lot of these drug molecules are quite insoluble. So if you can make them into smaller particles, they're a bit more soluble, so you need less of that drug. So that's, you know, that's stage one. Then if you can wrap that up into something like, say, a vesicle, which is, you imagine, like a soap bubble with the, uh, with the drug inside, 
and then get that to go right to that diseased cell before that bubble pops and releases the, uh, your, your, uh, your, your drug, then you've got a very effective targeted therapy. Uh, an awful lot of your technology seems to be a decade away, a, you know, a decade away from commercial use. Uh, what bits of it are you really sure uh, uh, will deliver uh, in the decade? Um, I think you know pretty much everything that we've spoken about is within a decade. Um, you know we're, we're talking about technology here, not science fiction, uh, which is what all the little robots are. In, in terms of you know what's what's here and now, I think you know certainly we've got 3D printing here. We've got online electric vehicles, graphene. We're probably about three or four years away from uh, from the real mainstream applications. But uh, I, I think. One of the things you've always got to do is just be a little bit rational and realistic about the timescales because technology often takes a little bit longer than anybody would ever imagine to, uh, to, to diffuse into, uh, into mainstream industry. And also, when people get a little bit focused on you know, nanotechnology or graphene, they also forget that there are other competing technologies uh, that are attempting to do the same job. Fusion has been 20 years away for the last 60 years, in other words. And it, and it still is, yes. Hi, thanks. That was really interesting. A point you made with regards to quantify itself. Um, so moving beyond pedometers where it's more specific, it's just interesting to notice that the way the healthcare system is currently structured, it doesn't necessarily support that. So whilst you might have more of these mobile health um, you know, gadgets and solutions around, you still are reliant on a medical expert interpreting and working with you on that data. I think there's a gap between the entrepreneurs and the technology and actually the medical support. So do you see that shifting or changing or is that just going to be stuck? Well, I've spent a lot of time looking at that. And I think one of, you know, what you're finding is, is if you're dealing with healthcare, there's, it's an industry that's got a lot of inertia in it. So things are done in a certain way with certain procedures. And of course, you know, some of these are you know, life critical decisions that are being made. So it's quite good to have a, a standard procedure. But the problem with any industry like that is that technology always gets way ahead of it. Uh, and even if we're talking about things like point of care diagnostics, for example, um, it's not just a question of giving someone a handheld device that they can use in a doctor's surgery. Then you have start have to think about uh, you know data privacy, patient confidentiality, all these other things. So there's um, uh, the technology is only part of the uh, the solution to the problem, and, and and you often need a bit of an organisational cultural change before the technology can be can be effectively used. So you're exactly right with that. Um, I noticed you said um, a lot of the developments from before were done by big companies and a lot of the developments nowadays are done, especially in IT, by little startups. I haven't found a lot of information on how you uh, basically open source nanotechnology. Without our PhD materials, how do you do that kind of research by yourself? Well, oddly enough, I was watching yesterday a, a video on YouTube of a guy down in uh, Hearn Bay, I, I forget his name, but he was, he was showing you how to make graphene in a bucket at home using common chemicals. So, uh, so you don't actually need a university lab to be able to uh, produce these things. And it's the same kind of thing in, uh, in, in biology now. You can send off for, for, uh, for kits, you can send off for, uh, for materials, you can get bugs. And, and there is this rise of what's beginning to be called garage biotech. So more and more, I mean, it's not down at the level of IT where a couple of guys can, can do something, but it's heading in that direction.
Thanks. At that moment in uh, your presentation, you speak about self-healing materials. How much time you estimate it will pass until self-healing materials will have same capacity of healing like organic world? Um, well, it depends what, what organic. Um, and of course, some organic materials heal in different ways. Let's talk about like human body. Okay, well, you know, the human body, once again, there's a lot of different aspects. If you break a bone, it, it does heal, but it might not heal in the, straight, in the same way, whereas if you have a small cut, it can heal very quickly. And I think we, you know, we're looking at the level of, of small cuts. The, the application that Delft are working on with the concrete, for example, is just simply to be able to repair things like earthquake damage when something does get cracked. Uh, and, and so what we're, what we're doing is, uh, and, uh, and this applies to all of our bio-inspired ideas, what we're doing is quite crude compared to what, uh, what, the, what the human body or, or even those insects that I showed could do. Uh, thanks very much, that was a really interesting talk. Um, you're obviously um, following these technologies really, really closely and have been for quite a long time. Uh, from a personal point of view, what's the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the one that you're most looking forward to from a selfish point of view? Um, good question. I think from a selfish point of view, I'm, I'm quite interested in a lot of the, uh, the medical diagnostic technologies because one of the things that we are absolutely certain of is the earlier you can detect something, the easier it is to do something about it. And uh, you know, we've all lost people to, to various diseases that, uh, that if they were more easily detected. So, so one of the sel both selfishly and altruistically, I think you know, diagnostic devices at very low cost could have you know, quite a massive impact on on, on the world. Now, coming back to the other question, how do you get the, uh, the healthcare industry to be able to adapt to that? You do have another problem that if you detect something, then you have an obligation to do something about it, which costs money. <laughs> oh, hi there. Um, yeah. You spoke earlier about um, nuclear power. What do you see as the future means of generating electricity? Um, I, th I think um, biotechnology gives us a lot of potential applications in terms of using sort of CO2 as a feedstock, using things like algae, fungi, you know, various other kind of bugs to, to produce biofuels. Um, solar, I think, you know, we're getting there. The, the problem is at the moment, uh, certainly with the organic solar, lifetime isn't quite good enough. And one of the biggest costs of solar is having a guy go up a ladder and put these things on the roof. And if they've got to change them every five years, then it's never going to be economic. Um, but I, I think solar's getting there. Nuclear is, is part of the energy mix, but I think you know, as we go forward, we've got to be realistic and realize that you know, the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time. We've got to have some kind of backup. Um, once we get to probably better battery technologies, and I touched on it with things like supercapacitors uh, for, for this load balancing, then I think that makes our job a lot easier. But at the moment, all we've got to do is, you know, if... Uh, if suddenly the demand for electricity goes up, you know, everybody puts their kettles on at halftime in a, in a football match, uh, all you've got to do is have a, a coal-fired uh, or gas-fired uh, generating plant on standby and spool that up quickly. Um, so I think, you know, that mixture, solar, nuclear, uh, various other renewables uh, is, is where we're going to go. But we've, we've got to find a way of plugging the gap over the next sort of 20 years. Thank you very much. Can we get a round of applause for Tim Harper, please? Next on the agenda is Mark Bishop with Robotics, Mechanical Bodies, Mystical Minds, Monstrous Dangers at 4 o'clock. Thank you.